Well, I would like to welcome you all um, to one of our lectures in the series, My Health, My Responsibility. And um, I would like to welcome our speaker, uh, Dr. Derek Smith, who is a clinical professor emeritus of psychiatry at UBC and still um, active in um, teaching medical students and residents and doing psychiatry. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I recognize that you're joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Now, I'm, um, Derek is going to talk to us about the legal history of medically assisted dying in Canada. And I know he'll say a few words about himself um, before he starts, uh, but I'd just like to mention that he's a past president of the BC Medical Association and a past board member of the Canadian Medical Association, as well as a past president of the Medical Legal Society. He served as chair of the board for the Greater Vancouver Mental Health Services Society and has provided an affidavit in support of legalizing medically assisted dying in the recent Gloria Taylor case in BC. Um, so what we'll do is hear from Derek uh, for about 45 minutes and then I will pose questions um, that you ask in the chat room. So be sure to um, write your questions as you think of them in the chat room and we'll give Derek a chance to address those after the talk um, and then we will adjourn. So I think over to you, Derek. All right, I think. Good, so we're ready to start then? We are. Good, uh, we're gonna have some uh, 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 technical issues because I'm not controlling the slide. So when I stop talking, the slide will advance hopefully. It's beyond my control though. So um, it's a great pleasure to be here. This is my uh, first event with the Emeriti. And as soon as I get less busy, I, I intend to become much more active. But what I'm gonna talk to you about today is the medical legal history of assisted dying. And uh, uh, this is a uniquely uh, British Columbia story, at least at the beginning, because most of the major players came out of uh, British Columbia. Good, so these are uh, either my qualifications or my conflicts of interest. And the conflict that I'll declare right away is that I'm not a, a dispassionate observer of this. I'm an advocate for uh, having access to assisted in dying. So I've been the, a former board member of Dying with Dignity Canada. I've been a former board member of the World Federation of Right to Die Societies, which uh, is a worldwide organization promoting assisted dying in uh, various countries around the world. I was an expert witness in the Carter case. Um, that was a, uh, the uh, Gloria Taylor case as well. Uh, I testified before the Special Parliamentary Committee on Bill C-14, and most recently uh, before the Senate on Bill C-7, that's in February of uh, 2020, and uh, Bill C-7 is the current uh, piece of legislation that defines assisted dying in Canada. So what I'd like you to uh, take away from this is to understand the medical legal history of uh, medical assistance in dying, MAID as it's now called, uh, and to be familiar with uh, Bill C-14, which uh, uh, was the original bill with us for assisted dying, and now Bill C-7, which is the current uh, uh, law, and to uh, discuss the role of psychiatry. I'm gonna say more about the psychiatric issues because that's one of the major uh, uh, points of controversy in the current legislation. So to understand uh, where we're going on this, you really have to have an understanding of the, uh, the, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And just about every case that I'm going to talk to you about, every legal case I'm going to talk to you about, hinges on these two sections. 
And section seven, everyone who ha has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and the right not to be deprived thereof, except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. And many of the, uh, the, of the uh, legal judgments have hinged on the fact that if you have a, a right to life, you also have a right to choose uh, when, you, uh, when you would like to die. Uh, section 15 uh, is the one uh, about no discrimination. So you cannot uh, have a, a law in place in Canada that discriminates on the basis of race, ethnic origin, color, religion, sex, age, mental or physical disability. And this is going to play a, a, a very much of a role in the current piece of legislation C7. And I'll say, say more about that later. So interestingly enough, uh, all these uh, uh, changes and uh, medical assistance in dying have not been under health legislation. They've been amendments to the criminal code. And the reason for that is that section 241, which has now been amended twice, it states that anyone assisting a person in committing suicide commits an indictable offense and no person can consent to death being inflicted on them. So that clearly had to be amended to allow uh, doctors, nurses, and pharmacists to uh, provide a medical assistance in dying. Uh, one of the major onuses on people who are providing these services is that if they run afoul of the law, they're committing a criminal act. It's not simply simply a piece of health legislation is part of the criminal code. And just to put this in the perspective, uh, uh, attempted suicide was once a criminal act, uh, and it's only been uh, not a criminal act since 1972. So our, our societal values on, on a, a, a suicide and assisted death have changed very significantly. So this is the first case, and uh, many of you probably uh, remember this, Sue Rodriguez, uh, was from uh, uh, British Columbia. She was suffering from uh, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. And uh, uh, she sought to have physician assisted dying. Uh, this was a very high profile case and she was uh, supported by various politicians, including Sven Robinson. And she went before the Supreme Court. It went all the way through the courts and the Supreme Court denied her the right to uh, physician assisted dying as, as, as it was then known by a 5-4 decision. It was very close. Uh, the justice writing for the majority, Justice Sapinka, said that, uh, that they did not know what to do because no other Western democracy permitted assistance in dying. Uh, interestingly enough, the person writing the decision for the minority was uh, uh, Justice Beverly McLaughlin, uh, who will play an even more prominent role as we go along. Uh, Sue was, although she was denied assisted dying by the Supreme Court, uh, a physician in British Columbia did assist her to die, and this was at the time an illegal act, and uh, it was never uh, it never prosecuted. And to show you how things have changed, you know, since that decision in 1993, in 1994, the state of Oregon was the first jurisdiction in the world that had legalized the medical assistance in dying, and since then, eight juris other jurisdictions uh, by 2010 around the world, including the Switzerland and many of the the Benlux countries had a, a legalized medical aid in dying. So this was the, the, the first the big case after Sue Rodriguez, and it was, uh, uh, it was quite a bit later. Um, uh, Kay Carter actually was dead at the time of this case. Uh, uh, Kay had gone to Switzerland for uh, a physician-assisted dying, and uh, Switzerland still remains the only jurisdiction in the world where a non-citizen can apply to have assisted dying. So she was suffering from a spinal stenosis. She was represented by her, her daughter at this legal case. And there were two, uh, three other uh, uh, plaintiffs as well, but she, the case is known as the Carter case, which I think is uh, quite fitting because she was the lead uh, plaintiff. So this was her, uh, this case was heard by Madam Justice Lynn Smith. Uh, uh, she was a, a Supreme Court justice at the time. She's now a, a member of the Faculty of Law at UBC. And uh, she wrote an exhaustive decision. Now, many of you don't sit around reading legal decisions, but this decision was almost 400 pages long. It was, a, it was incredibly thorough and covered all of the issues. Um, and what she found was PAD, or Physician Assisted Dying, 
would not impede the development of palliative care. That was one of the arguments put before her. The second one, a system could be designed that would protect the vulnerable because many people were concerned and still are that if you had assisted dying, elderly relatives would be uh, uh, encouraged to, uh, uh, to die by their relatives who wanted to get their hands on their assets or estates. And the last one was physicians were capable of assessing uh, patient competence. So this case, as uh, usually happens, when the when a decision is made, that it gets appealed uh, up to the top. And the next uh, the stage of appeal was the BC Court of Appeal. This is 2013. Two one decision held that Justice uh, Smith had erred by not considering herself bound by the Rodriguez case. Uh, interestingly enough, the Chief Justice was the only was the one who dissented from this. So after the uh, after the Court of Appeal made their decision, it was then headed to the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court of Canada, you can now see that the, uh, the wheels of justice dry, uh, run very slowly because this is now two years later. Uh, and this was this is a, a, a picture of uh, Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin, who was a prominent uh, 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 lawyer in Vancouver and was appointed to the Supreme Court. And uh, um, Chief Justice McLaughlin has uh, now retired and I'm happy to report is again living in, uh, in Vancouver. So what, what the Supreme Court decided was that things had changed since Rodriguez. And I'm not gonna give you the, the legalese on this, but the, the principles of overbreadth and gross disproportionality had changed. I think what had happened was uh, that uh, the attitudes of society had changed very significantly between when the court heard Rodriguez and when the court heard the Carter case. So the Supreme Court allowed the appeal. Uh, this was appealing this, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Court of Appeal in BC. They found that denying physician assisted dying offended section seven of the charter. And furthermore, properly designed and administrative safeguards were capable of protecting vulnerable people from abuse and error. And that was basically the, the same finding that Madam Justice Lynn Smith arrived at. So what they, what they decided was that the physician assisted dying should be available for a competent, that's a legal definition, adult person. An adult uh, was uh, turned out to be 18 years of age or older. Second thing is you must have a grievous and irremediable medical condition and the third one, that this condition causes enduring suffering that is intolerable to the individual. Now, that's, that's very important because it was not up to doctors or lawyers or anyone else to determine whether the suffering uh, was intolerable. It is really up to the individual patient, individual citizen. So this uh, really empowered individuals to be in charge of their own end-of-life decisions. So uh, they also concluded that Rodriguez did not prevent uh, Madam Justice Lynn Smith from reviewing the constitutional issues. The PAD was permissible for grievously ill people. Prohibition offended uh, uh, Section 7 of the Charter. And uh, uh, Ms. Taylor, uh, was, who was the, uh, the plaintiff who was alive, was granted access to uh, PAD. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, she died of natural causes. And this is... Uh, one of these stories is that a certain number of people who have been granted access by the courts or legislation to assisted dying in the end choose not to go that route and have a, have a, a, a natural death. Uh, the Supreme Court gave the government of Canada a year to amend the criminal legislation. So the, the decision was unanimous, which is, uh, which is unique, but even more unique was the fact that all nine justices signed the decision. This has happened, I think, only about three or four times in the history of Canada. And the, the reason for doing that was to send a very clear signal to Parliament that the Supreme Court uh, uh, had a compelling opinion on this. Um, this the, the sitting government at the time, the Conservatives, who uh, remain uh, uh, even to this day opposed to assisted dying, really did nothing for eight months. An election changed the government, the Liberals came in, the new government asked for a six month extension and they were given a four month extension to, uh, to amend the criminal code. So this, these are um, 
between the, the Carter decision and C-14, which was the legislation, uh, people assist, uh, seeking assisted dying had to apply to the courts. Uh, in BC, all of the appeals were heard by uh, Chief Justice Chris Hingston, and in total, about uh, 12 persons across Canada were granted access to assisted dying before the uh, legislation was passed. The case I want to tell you about was quite compelling because a court in Alberta granted assisted dying to a woman who only had a psychiatric condition. This was appealed by the Attorney General of Canada and uh, BC, uh, but by a 3-0 decision, the Court of Appeal, this is in Alberta, upheld the decision. So this is the story of this woman. Um, uh, I actually uh, uh, had the, uh, the, the great uh, uh, privilege and honor of assessing her and giving a brief to the court. Uh, uh, she was a 58 year old woman and she had a simple, one simple diagnosis of severe conversion disorder. And when I, when I first heard this, I thought this is probably one of the worst cases to take forward because conversion disorder is usually considered to be not a major psychiatric condition. However, what I learned from that and subsequently was that it, it really has nothing to do about the diagnosis and everything to do about the person who's living with the diagnosis. So EF had applied to the Supreme Court of Alberta for assistance in dying. She'd undergone extensive treatment from psychiatrists, neurologists, and other specialists. She's been under treatment for 25 years. She's had medication, psychotherapy, ECT, all without any particular benefit. And she did not want any treatment. Uh, just to give you a sense of some of her symptoms, uh, she had not opened her eyes in the last 10 years of her life, even though neurologists uh, had, uh, had given opinion that there was no reason why she could not open her eyes. Uh, she was a very sick woman and was, uh, was suffering. So she was supported in her request for assisted dying by her longstanding family doctor, which is important because the court pays a lot of attention to what family doctors have to say, particularly a family doctor who's been with this woman for more than 30 years. And she was also supported by her family members. And she was granted access to assisted dying by Madam Justice Bast on May 5th, 2016. So the Attorneys General of Canada and BC appealed this decision. And I believe the reason they appealed it was because they were trying to uh, uh, exclude uh, psychiatric illness from, uh, uh, from being considered for uh, assisted dying. So what the, court, the, what the court concluded was that Carter, the Carter decision, did not require people to have a terminal illness. Uh, secondly, that pe people with a psychiatric illness were not excluded from ass assisted dying if they met all the other criteria. And uh, the, the, the court spent a considerable part of their judgment criticizing the attorney generals of BC and Canada for bringing this appeal forward. And they, uh, by a unanimous three to zero decision, granted uh, EF access to assisted dying. And uh, the end of the story also involves Vancouver because uh, uh, EF and 10 of her family members flew to Vancouver uh, where she had an assisted death. So just to give you a flavor of what else was going on, uh, there was a lot of political uh, 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 rumblings about assisted dying well before the uh, Carter case. Between 1991 and 2010, the House of Commons debated six private members' bills seeking to decriminalize assisted suicide, but none of these could ever gra uh, get the traction to allow the, these bills to uh, be passed. Uh, what was uh, um, done, though, in Quebec was, and this was before, be, before Carter, they established an all-party select committee on dying with dignity, which recommended legal recognition of PAD. Now, uh, unlike the rest of Canada, uh, Quebec, uh, the politicians in Quebec have shown real leadership on this. Uh, the rest of Canada, including the, the current government, I think are only uh, reluctantly reactive to court decisions. And there's been very little political leadership in Canada uh, on this issue. So in Quebec, they passed Bill 52, which allowed assisted dying as of December 2015. And to put that into perspective, that was before, before the Carter decision came down. So uh, after, the, uh, after the Carter decision, the government struck a special joint committee 
to study this. And uh, I was uh, privileged to uh, give testimony to this group. And what they recommended was this. First of all, they changed the name and the name became Medical Assistance in Dying or MAID. And the reason for that was that nurse practitioners were allowed to provide MAID quite apart from doctors. So it became less of a physician thing and more of a medical issue. So it, it recommended that for terminal and non-terminal grievous and irremedial conditions that citizens should have access to assisted dying. Uh, this would include people with nothing but uh, a diagnosis but psychiatric illness. Uh, although the, the, they recommended this include people 18 years of age and older, they recommended studying a bill for mature minors. In other words, mature minors would be probably uh, uh, teenagers 13 to 18 years of age who were uh, legally competent but otherwise would qualify for assisted dying. They, uh, they, they recommended that we look at advanced requests. And by that, I mean people who were uh, approaching their death, but were, who were worried about slipping into dementia and being uncompetent, not competent, could, could sign a legal document appointing someone else to make a, to make a request for made on their behalf. behalf. Uh, they recommended national reporting. They recommended better, better palliative care and also a national strategy for dementia. So this was the piece of legislation that finally made its way through Ottawa after a great deal of debate. It was an amendment to the criminal code. It exempted doctors, nurses, and pharmacists from criminal prosecution. <coughs> uh, doctors and nurses uh, could administer um, medication either intravenously or write a prescription for the patient uh, that would result in their death. Now, um, I'll say more about uh, uh, this uh, later on, but the, uh, what is happening in Canada is that it's almost exclusively intravenous medication that's being used now. So Bill C-14 uh, is stated that the person must be 18 years of, of age. Uh, they must be a Canadian citizen, be eligible for a Canadian health care. They have to have a grievous and irremediable condition. Uh, and again, uh, note that the, the, the intolerable uh, suffering is defined by the person. And this was the phrase that the, that the Minister of, uh, of Justice, who happened to be from, from a Vancouver as well, natural death has become reasonably foreseeable. Uh, and I met with the minister to discuss this phrase because uh, uh, most doctors had no idea what that meant. Uh, natural death has become reasonably foreseeable. And we had opinion that it might be two months, it could be eight years, but no one knew what it meant. And remember that doctors who, who are uh, providing the assistance in dying, if they did not follow the letter of the law would be criminally responsible. So it was uh, every, every doctor in Canada who was involved wanted to know what that definition was. So the process for assisted dying, two medical practitioners or nurse practitioners must assess the person. There must be two independent witnesses. And this was a, a bit of a problem because many people who were elderly could not come up with two independent witnesses. So uh, Dying with Dignity Canada, an organization that I belonged to at the time, uh, put in place a, a, a national program to provide independent witnesses. It couldn't be anyone who knew the person or would benefit from their will. Uh, there had to be 10 days before the request for assisted dying and the provision of, uh, of MAID. Uh, the patient must be given an opportunity to change their mind immediately before. So throughout the assessment, you have to determine that the person is competent. But in the, uh, uh, in the minutes before the uh, lethal injection was given, again, the, per the, the person had a chance to change their mind, and some people did. So there must be voluntary informed consent from a competent individual. So some of the problems with C-14 was that many critics believed that C-14 was not compliant with Carter because they narrowed it considerably. Uh, we had pressured the government to make a, uh, a referral to the Supreme Court to rule on the constitutionality, but they decided not to do that. There was heavy lobbying from the Catholic Church and other individuals as well, other organizations, to narrow the rules of Carter. And the way they narrowed it was to have this phrase, natural death must be reasonably foreseeable, 
inserted into the legislation. So this is the next case that came up uh, after C7 uh, uh, passed. Uh, this was from uh, 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 Ontario. AB was an 80-year-old woman who had osteoarthritis. And those of you who are uh, not doctors, this is a, a condition that people don't usually die from. It can be, it can be debilitating, but people typically you don't think of people dying from osteoarthritis. And the issue here was that that sticking phrase, was her natural death reasonably foreseeable? And the arguments from the people who were opposed to this was that well, people don't die of osteoarthritis. They die from heart attacks. They die from cancer. They die from many other things, but not osteoarthritis. So this woman had knee and hip replacements. She had metal rods in her legs and back. She refused any more operation. So uh, Justice Perel concluded that this woman had a, and the phrase here is important, a, a quote, trajectory towards death. And what she concluded was natural death need not be connected to a particular terminal disease or condition, but rather you have to look at the particular person's medical circumstances. So again, what we need to do uh, is to look at the person, not the diagnosis in terms of uh, making assessments for assisted dying. Uh, this is a much more recent case. Uh, uh, this took place in Quebec. Uh, John Truchon uh, is the man who you can see in that wheelchair in the, uh, in the green shirt. Um, he was a, quite a remarkable individual. Uh, he's 51 years old. He had spastic cerebral palsy since birth. And he was for his entire adult life uh, completely paralyzed except for his left arm. What happened was he had an untoward event in which his left arm became paralyzed. So he was truly disabled. He was confined to his wheelchair and unable to move. And to, uh, uh, to understand the, the, the suffering that he was ex experiencing, his cognitive functioning was at least normal and some people believe well above normal. So he had the two other conditions, severe spinal stenosis and uh, myelomalacia. Uh, the justice who heard this in Quebec, Madam Justice Baudin concluded, uh, and when listening to all the evidence, that there was no evidence of abuse, a slippery slope, or other risks for vulnerable people. And this was very much the arguments that were heard in court. And that was that vulnerable people might be taken advantage of uh, by uh, greedy relatives or other people who wanted to have to hasten their death to get their, their uh, assets. So, uh, this was now the third time in the in a court decision where the justice had decided there's no no evidence of risk for that. They accepted the testimony of the psychiatrist, Dr. Justine Dembo, and they rejected the testimony of three other psychiatrists. Uh, one of those, Dr. Sanu Ganade, was the uh, past president of the Canadian Psychiatric Association, and two other psychiatrists. So, uh, within the psychiatric community, there is very uh, uh, hot, hot debates and uh, strongly held opinions one way or the other on psychiatric, on the assisted dying, not only for the disabled, but also for people with psychiatric illness. And uh, what the uh, Justice Bodan concluded was that this phrase that had been the bothering uh, many of us since the C-14 first saw the light of day, reasonably foreseeable natural death infringed section seven and 15 of the charter. Uh, and the argument here was uh, 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 that uh, Jean Touchant did not have a foreseeable natural death. He probably could have continued living in his wheelchair without any ability to move any parts of his body for the next 20 years. But the justice decided that this was not reasonable and that uh, he was uh, granted uh, access to assisted dying. So this was the, uh, the this was the first annual report following Carter. The government set in place a, a mechanism to produce annual reports on assisted dying, and uh, uh, you can see uh, assisted dying in the 2019. Uh, almost 6,000 people died by assisted dying, which is a 26 percent increase since 2018. Uh, some of the critics say though this is this is evidence of the slippery slope that once you get started, more and more people are going to be, uh, going to be uh, assisted to die. Uh, in 2016, there were only a thousand people. So 
There's a five-fold increase between 2016 and 2019. However, this only accounted for 2% of all deaths in Canada, and the fully 80% of people with assisted dying, as you would expect, were people 65 years of older, and by far the, uh, the uh, most common medical conditions, and again, you could probably uh, uh, guess this yourself, particularly those of you who are, are physicians, cancer is the big, big one, respiratory illness like a, a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and neurologic conditions like uh, ALS. There was no reporting on psychiatric diagnoses. Now, uh, my estimate was that probably in 2019, there were maybe two individuals who uh, uh, had an assisted death based nothing uh, but on a psychiatric diagnosis. And both of those were people with uh, uh, eating disorders. Uh, people chose, uh, about a third of them chose to uh, die in hospital and the uh, a third chose to die at home. The other people died in various other locations, uh, offices and so on. However, this is important that simply asking for assisted dying does not mean it's automatically uh, uh, granted because 26% of those who request, uh, people who requested were denied. And of, of those who were eligible, 15% uh, ultimately denied, uh, died of another cause of death, uh, a natural cause, if you like. And uh, uh, almost 4% uh, when, uh, when facing assisted dying and when the doctor said to them, uh, are you certain you want to continue with this? 4% said no, they changed their mind. So uh, this is pretty much the experience of people who have been involved with uh, providing assisted dying. So these are some of the rules for psychiatry. And psychiatry, I think, has a, an important role to play here. Uh, one of the ones is for assessing capacity and competence. Uh, assessing is the person grievous and irremediable ill in the, in the context of psychiatric illness. And assessing psychiatric symptoms in patients without a primary psychiatric diagnosis, because uh, about uh, half the people who uh, have uh, terminal cancer, for example, will develop a, a, uh, an episode of depression. So competence and capacity are interesting. Competence is a legal term and is specific to the task at hand uh, and includes elements such as capacity, the jurisdiction and age. For example, under C-14, someone who is 17 would not be competent because they, uh, they are not 18 years of age. Uh, mental capacity assessment is necessary to determine uh, legal competence and the components of capacity are, you have to be able to uh, receive, process, hold and understand information. You have to appreciate the implications for your own situation. You have to demonstrate to the assessor that you're able to reason with the information. And then finally, you have to express a firm treatment choice. So uh, all people, including those with psychiatric illness, are presumed to be capable until otherwise uh, determined. Uh, capacity, however, can be uh, you know, compromised by uh, some of the common uh, illnesses that we see, psychosis, uh, dementia, intellectual disability, and no very low IQ and severe mood disorders. Um, but inherent mental factors that limit choice should not be the, the private person of access to appropriate medical treatments. Uh, and that uh, uh, people who uh, have capacity, who are competent, may use advanced directives. And we're you know, currently in Canada and certainly in BC, we're able to have all manner of advanced directives such that, that if you go into hospital, you can, uh, you can have a, a directive that says, you do not want to receive antibiotics. You do not want to receive intravenous fluids. You do not want to be tube fed. So those things are all available currently. The one thing you cannot have in Canada is an advance request is the name, advance request for uh, assistance in dying. So these are the specific questions that, uh, and these are questions which, uh, which I use when I'm doing an assessment uh, to determine if someone is uh, competent or not. Uh, there, are, there are many more sophisticated tools for doing this and for anyone who's interested, I'll tell you where you can access a, a full document that, uh, that that discusses this. So the the first thing is, you know, what's the, what's the medical problem that you have? 
what's your understanding of the treatment that you've had or other treatment that's available, including things like uh, palliative care, for example. And uh, the next one is that, uh, you know, you've requested assistance in dying. Have you considered other treatments, palliative care or no treatment whatsoever? Uh, and you have to make sure that the person has, uh, is fully informed on what the options are. The next one, have you discussed this with your family and loved ones? Uh, this, for the, most of the people who are requesting made, they are supported by their family. Where it gets difficult is where there is dissent within the family, where some family members do not want the person to have assisted dying, other people do. And that makes it a, a more difficult and complicated uh, assessment. Uh, then the next question, do you understand the process for completed assisted dying? Next one, have you made a final decision about proceeding with this? The next one, can you, and this is a demonstrating reason, can you tell me how you reached that decision? And then finally, at the end of this whole process, and this might take a course of a, probably a full hour, are you certain about proceeding with assisted dying? So um, this was one of the points that has been debated in court and in parliament. Uh, some of our psychiatric colleagues have said that, can, that uh, mental capacity assessment cannot be reliably completed by psychiatrists. Uh, this is one of the papers that refutes that, and that is that there's good evidence that psychiatrists using a clinical interview, and particularly if they're using tools such as the MacArthur Competency Assessment Tool, can uh, reliably and reproducibly uh, 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 conduct a, a mental capacity assessment. This is another major issue for, um, for psychiatry. And uh, uh, for those of us who are psychiatrists, I know that there's at least one other psychiatrist on this, uh, on this uh, uh, webinar. You know, psychiatrists spend most of their uh, practicing careers trying to prevent suicide. Uh, you know, uh, we are taught that uh, to deal with the issues like uh, psychosis and depression with a view towards uh, improving those conditions so that people no longer are wanting to kill themselves. And we also know that 90% of all completed suicides are the result of psychiatric illness. So um, uh, on the other hand, there are some people who argue that in some situations, suicide can be a rational choice, even when with patients with psychiatric illness. And you have to recall that, you know, a medical assistance in dying, one of the two ways that, that you can uh, achieve a medical assistance is to either suicide, in other words, take lethal, lethal medication yourself or euthanasia, which is have a doctor inject you with lethal uh, uh, medication. So uh, this is a, a, a very serious debate within psychiatry. Uh, uh, studies from Oregon and the Netherlands, which have been uh, pioneers in this field have shown that uh, both somewhere up to 50% of patients requesting uh, assisted dying have depressive symptoms, even if they don't have a primary psychiatric disorder. Uh, about half of the patients in Netherlands, in Netherlands requesting PAD have depression. Most people with depression are competent. Uh, from Switzerland, 27% uh, of patients receiving assistance in dying have depression. And looking at the palliative care programs in Canada, about 12% had a genuine desire to die, and 52% of those had a mental disorder. Uh, this, this additional information from Oregon, uh, people with cancer or ALS, uh, many of them were suffering from depression and anxiety. Um, there's also no good data currently that we can successfully treat depression when the underlying condition is, is a cancer. And there's two contradictory views in the literature, the medical literature regarding patients with depression. One is they need to be protected from assistance in dying. And the second one is they're being denied access to assistance in dying. So this is the debate that uh, uh, we're going to have very shortly in parliament. This is more information from the Netherlands. Uh, uh, this is the, the, the first year end of life clinic, uh, and this is uh, um, uh, relatively old data now, but there, of, of 645 requests, only 25% were granted uh, assistance in dying. 
and of those 19% died before the assessment and the requests that were granted for a, for a medical condition, a somatic condition, 32%, cognitive decline, about a third as well, and the psychological or psychiatric condition of 5%. This is data from Belgium. This is the first 100 patients in Belgium who requested assistance in dying solely based on a psychiatric condition. And uh, when again, when I saw this paper, I was astounded, not by depression, which everyone would have expected, but by personality disorder and Asperger's syndrome. Asperger's is um, uh, sort of like high functioning autism. Um, and uh, I, I, I found this a, a pretty disturbing. Uh, fortunately, uh, about six months later, I had an opportunity to be in Belgium to sit down with the colleagues who had written this, written this paper, and we reviewed all of these cases. And again, I learned a lesson now for the third time that the diagnosis really has very little to do uh, with the person's situation. You have to understand the person as a whole and not rely on a diagnosis to understand what's going on with them and are they suffering and do they uh, really qualify for assistance in dying. Uh, of these uh, people, only 48 were, uh, were accepted, uh, uh, accepted for a physician in dying. And again, the numbers are quite small, even in Belgium, which has a long history of uh, allowing assisted dying for psychiatric disorders. Only 3% of all cases were primarily suffering from a psychiatric condition. So these are some additional points uh, concerning a psychiatric patients. Uh, patients do not have to avail themselves of all possible conditions uh, can, and treatments to be considered irremediable. It's really up to the person to decide when they have had enough treatment. Um, there is also uh, good evidence that some psychiatric illness is irremediable, and that was certainly the decision of the court with EF, but this is uh, strongly uh, uh, contested by a number of uh, prominent current psychiatrists. Uh, some authors have stated that most patients with depression will achieve admission if they're given high quality treatment, and they showed remission rates of 60%. However, if you look at the other side of this, it means that 40% remain, remain ill. And even in big uh, um, um, uh, studies such as the STAR-D trials, which looked at a huge number of real life patients, uh, 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 after four or five uh, sessions of treatment, a good number of them did not remit, they're de they're de they remained depressed. Um, and uh, de this is from one of my colleagues, uh, Justine Dembo, and and uh, myself uh, wrote in the CMEJ that you, if you deny uh, assisted dying to competent but vulnerable and stigmatized populations, you may be consigning them to years of suffering or horrible death by suicide if they're not able to access uh, uh, medical assistance in dying. So this brings us right up until the present. Um, uh, at, following the True Sean case, where the uh, where the judge decided that uh, your uh, uh, natural death must be reasonably foreseeable was unconstitutional. I had presumed that the government would come back with new legislation and we'd see the end of this, but no, we didn't. We, I'm never uh, always surprised by the, uh, the twists and turns that the politicians take on this. So what they came up with was uh, two classes of persons, those whose natural death was not foreseeable and those whose natural death is foreseeable, mind the, uh, keeping in mind that no one has ever come up with a definition of what natural death is foreseeable actually means. So we now have two classes of people. So if your natural death is not foreseeable by whatever criteria are being used, uh, there is now it must be 90 days between the assessment and the provision of assistance in dying. And the natural, uh, for natural death is foreseeable, there's no time frame. Remember it used to be, 10 days under, uh, under C-14. Um, assistance in dying can proceed if the person whose natural death is foreseeable loses capacity if they have already been approved for mate. And this was a, a real uh, a sticking point for Dying with Dignity Canada because there were a number of cases across Canada where the person had been approved, but between the time they were approved and when the, it, it came time to uh, provide made, they had lost capacity. This is called uh, Audrey's Amendment. And um, made is not allowed for persons with the sole diagnosis of mental illness 
for the next two years. Now, this was the result of considerable maneuvering. The, the initial uh, bill, C-17, was attempting to, uh, to disallow anyone with a psychiatric illness alone to not be eligible for MAID. And if you think back to what I said about Section 15 of the Charter, this so obviously offends the Charter. I was astounded. Uh, if this if this bill had gone through with with a, a blanket exemption uh, for people with mental illness, it would have been challenged in the courts for sure, and almost certainly would have lost. And uh, fortunately, uh, we had a, a, an ally in the Senate uh, who was a personal friend of mine, uh, Dr. Stan Kucher, who's a psychiatrist from Nova Scotia, and Stan managed to push through an amendment from the Senate uh, to put, if you like, a sunset clause. Uh, for mental illness for two years. So what this does is it, it gives Parliament two years to study what safeguards need to be in place for assistance in dying where the sole diagnosis is a mental illness. So this is what the, the, the College of Physicians and Surgeons in BC have to say and that every doctor who's involved with the with uh, assistance in dying pays great attention to what the college says, because keep in mind again, if you, uh, if you uh, go against the law, you're committing a criminal offense. So uh, the first one is important, and that is that doctors who object to MAID, and there are many of my colleagues who do for a number of different reasons, for ethical reasons, for religious reasons. If you have a patient uh, and, you're, uh, and you object to MAID, then you must provide an effective transfer to other practitioners. So uh, you must make a referral to someone who you know uh, will discuss the possibility of made with your patient. The next one is the provider. Provider is the person who actually uh, is the person who uh, gives the medications for assisted dying. You must make sure that all the legal criteria are met. You have to ensure this is a voluntary request and there's no external pressure from uh, other organizations or family members or anybody else. There now has to be one independent witness, which is a, a change from having two. Uh, the patient knows that they can withdraw the request at any time and that where death is not reasonably foreseeable, again, no, no one seems to know what that means, but if that, that's the case, the patient has been informed of other means to relieve suffering. There may be a constant cons consultation with an appropriate expert. Uh, I probably a, an expert in if the person is uh, has cancer with a cancer expert, or if it's a psychiatric illness with a uh, psychiatrist. And 90 days, uh, which is in the legislation, can be shortened if a person is at risk for losing capacity. That's an uh, an important uh, step forward because um, there have been a number of people in the in Canada and the number of uh, people I know in BC who have uh, chosen to have an assisted death well before they needed to because they were concerned they were gonna be losing capacity. And if you, were, if you have a, a diagnosis of a dementia and you lose capacity, then you are not eligible for assisted dying and you're stuck with uh, living uh, in a demented state for the next uh, two to five years. So this is further information from the College of Physicians. So a registrant, that's a doctor who gives or administers a substance uh, to the patient for completing medical death, completes the medical certificate. And on the certificate, uh, the cause of death is the underlying illness or cause uh, not assisted uh, dying. The maid has to be reported. Uh, they have to report the underlying illness causing the ill remediable condition in part one and the death is considered to be natural. So this is an organization, again, uh, with a very strong BC flavor to it. This is a group of uh, doctors uh, and uh, nurses and pharmacists, uh, but primarily doctors who came together after, uh, after uh, Bill uh, C-14 was passed uh, to provide an organizational and, and uh, uh, educational framework for educating doctors about assistance in dying. Uh, the current president is uh, uh, Stephanie Green, who is a family doctor in, uh, uh, in Victoria. Uh, many of the original members are from BC. This group now has, has held five annual uh, national meetings. They provide education for Canadian healthcare providers. 
uh, they also have produced a very detailed document on assessing uh, competence, uh, which you can access from their website if you're interested in doing so. So this is the summary. We're going to uh, wrap up now. So medical assistance in dying is legal in Canada under certain conditions. Canadians uh, can be assisted in dying using oral or intravenous medications. In practice, intravenous administration is the norm. Uh, and there continues to be significant opposition to providing the service in Catholic healthcare facilities. And I think significant political opposition uh, from uh, the Conservative Party of Canada uh, and uh, disabilities groups and other, other organizations. So I, I'm gonna finish there and I'm happy to uh, discuss this with you or answer any questions that you have. Okay, thanks very much, Derek. Um, we all remember the Rodriguez case very well and I'm sure we've all been following the progress of medically assisted dying since that time. And of course, at our time of life, it's one of the things that we probably talk about with people close to us. So really appreciate that. And um, any of you who would like to ask questions but have not yet done so, um, please write them in the chat function of the Zoom. And I will ask um, Derek a couple questions that we have there. Uh, one of them is, does Quebec allow out-of-province assisted death? Um, I, I'm not certain about that, but I think the answer is uh, probably no. I think you pretty much have to be within the. You have to be. You have to be eligible for Canadian health care, um, and I think there the rules are pretty tight around having to be a, a resident in the jurisdiction in which you received assisted dying. But I'm. I'm not actually, I'm not hundred percent sure on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Now you've spoken quite a lot about depression either as a primary condition or as a, an accompanying um, uh, condition. Um, and you say it's still under discussion and that the current regulation in C7 is that probably somebody with severe depression would have to wait two years to, to be, so the question is, does suffering from intractable severe depression interfere with permission um, to make a decision about ending your life? Well, for the, for the next two years, you cannot have assisted dying for a sole psychiatric diagnosis. That's pretty clear. Uh, what has happened is that the parliament has set up a committee to study what the rules are going to be around this. And again, this is a, a an interesting BC twist, the uh, chairperson of the committee studying this is uh, uh, Dr. Hetty Fry, who's the member of parliament for the part of Vancouver where I live and a past president of the Medical Association. So there's going to be a, a lot of uh, committee hearings uh, uh, representing the House of Commons, the Senate, and uh, uh, average Canadians with, a, with a, a long list of experts who are going to try to determine what the rules need to be to be put in place to ensure that people with nothing but a psychiatric illness can have reasonable access, but are also protected. It's going to be a lot of, a lot of politics involved with this. Um, okay, great. And uh, let me just say to Nicola, does that answer your question? Can you unmute yourself? I don't know uh, if you can. Yeah, yes, uh, I, was, I was asking about that committee, but also is it not studying whether we can have advanced direct well, the, the, that committee is not studying that. The government has, has committed to two other groups, but they're very slow off the mark with this. They promised this when C, C14 was passed. And the, the two other groups are, um, you know, mature minors, which is a very small group of people, maybe a handful of uh, teenagers a year who are dying from cancer. And then the, 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 the big issue, which they are really uh, showing no enthusiasm about, is advanced requests, which is the ability of someone who is a, in, in entering into a dementing illness to appoint another person who can decide uh, when, if they're not competent, that other person can uh, uh, legally agree for them to have assisted dying. And that the politics on this are, are enormous and we're gonna see all the same, the usual suspects line up in parliament to argue for and against this. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, uh, given the growing body of data regarding the benefits of palliative care for a variety of conditions, 
is palliative care recommended strongly for people who are requesting MAID in case they may not have considered it or tried it? Well, I, I think uh, a person assessing someone for MAID uh, should uh, be, uh, should uh, certainly ensure that the person knows all of the options that are available for them. People like myself who are advocates for assisted dying are strongly in favor of palliative care. That's one of the end of end of life options. Comfort care is another one. Um, but I have I have had two friends in the last year die of palliative care, and I I'm telling you it was a not a pretty sight and uh, uh, emotionally draining for the family. Uh, in the end, uh, people uh, can be. Uh, uh, made comfortable and the, and the people who believe in palliative care do not believe that they're assisting in death. What they're doing is making people comfortable, but they do that by giving them large doses of uh, narcotic analgesics and uh, not giving them any uh, uh, intravenous food or any intravenous water. So um, the, the, the two people who I've seen the, who have had palliative care had taken seven days to die, uh, which I thought was a uh, not a way that I'd necessarily want to go. However, it is an option. I, I think uh, palliative care should be fully funded. Palliative care currently is, is not available in, in many communities across British Columbia, particularly small communities. Um, so the big cities have, uh, have reasonable access to palliative care. Small cities do not. So palliative care is certainly, whether we think it's a good or bad idea, it's certainly one of the options that should be available. And someone uh, requesting MAID should have had a full discussion with their, with their family doctor and with the assessor about whether they've considered palliative care as an option. Great, and you, you talked as if there's a difference between palliative care and comfort care, is there? Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, I think comfort care is, uh, is, uh, is pretty much the same, but that's a term that's, uh, that's uh, frequently used. And it was certainly used with one of the one of my friends who died uh, within the last two months. Okay, thank you. And um, here's one that we all think about, I think. And if a person is in the early stages of dementia, is it possible to monitor the progression of the condition and judge when that person is close to losing capacity, but still able to access MAID? Well, it, it is, uh, but that's not always uh, necessarily an easy thing to do, particularly if you're not, if you don't have a very attentive medical care, or if you're not aware of it yourself, or if your friends or relatives aren't. Um, uh, I, I, I think there have been a number of cases across Canada, in, in, including one that I am personally involved with in the, in the Vancouver, uh, where the relatives who, uh, the person who has had going into a dementing illness has seen what dementia is all about. They've had relatives or friends who have lived through dementia. And uh, I can tell you, uh, having witnessed the uh, death of my mother-in-law through dementia, it is not a pretty sight. People end up uh, in, uh, in diapers or being uh, fed through tubes. They don't know who they are. They don't know who their relatives are. They are being kept alive, but there is no quality of life that they would ever have wanted. So uh, many people who have seen that do not want to enter into that uh, kind of, uh, of an end of life state. So the risk of waiting too long is that if you are not competent at the moment before you get assisted dying, then you are gonna be stuck living with dementia. Um, so uh, if, if someone is in that situation, then they need to, need to be very carefully monitored. And as I've said, many people uh, will choose to die too soon in order to not have the risk of becoming incompetent. Right, yeah, I think that's one that we all think about and care about a lot. So yes. I think on that pleasant note, we will wind this up and say, thank you very much. Um, now we're all clear in one place, instead of keeping up with articles year by year by year um, about this history. And um, we appreciate this very much. So thanks, Derek. And My I pleasure. hope that you will um, now just find the odd moment to, attain, to attend some of our programs, even if you go, don't get very involved in the college right now, uh, an hour here or there, you might be able to spare and have a good time. So anyway, goodbye to all and enjoy this lovely weather. And thanks again, Derek. Bye now.